Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the channel. This is your host, Young Brando, live from Los Angeles. We're going to talk about watches. We are going to talk about mainly the exclusive timepieces auction coming up by the Monaco Legend Group, whose uh, department, whose watch department is led by Davide Parmigiani um, in collaboration with Claude Cohen, uh, who leads this auction house. Um, I don't think it's it takes a genius to figure out that this auction house is based in Monaco. Yeah, sorry about that. I needed to take care of that. Um, and this particular auction is going to take place on April 20th and 21st. I believe they have just released the first, or rather the whole uh, list of watches just very recently. There are going to be previews in uh, Milano on April 8th, 9th, and 10th in the Mandarin Oriental Hotel. And of course, in the lead up to the auction in Monaco, there will be three days of preview as well. If you read the mainstream uh, outlets, you may have come across uh, the Patek Philippe uh, single button split second chronograph. So let's take a look at that. Maybe let's start with that particular watch and go from there. There are a lot of interesting pieces. One of those Kadhafi watches, again in the cocktail watch style rather than the ellipse, uh, which I had personally not seen before in Patek. I have just shown one of those watches, or in fact, a number of them um, from the recent history of auctions. And there is one uh, made by Vachon Constantin that's being currently sold in an auction by in Eichen Zurich. Um, and that's that, by the way, is an auction that we might return to at some point that's ending on april 2nd and i didn't necessarily discuss all the watches that came up there uh, so let me post the links for the two of those this is the link to the inachen zurich auction if you want me to bring up any watches from there and here is the link to the Monaco Legend auction. Lot number 90 is a very rare Patek Philippe uh, timepiece. It has a number of uh, important connections to the history of aviation and motorsports in the US. And uh, that relationship uh, has been very nicely catalogued or recorded by Mark Kozlarich in Odinki. The piece is apparently ordered sometime in the winter in Zagmoritz, um, 1928 or 29, by the American uh, entrepreneur Harry Gordon Selfridge, 
who founded uh, the London-based Selfridges uh, department store. Uh, he was apparently very good friends with Sir Henry O'Neill Dehane Seagrave, who uh, was a daredevil of sorts in his time, a motorsports superstar who went after many different kinds of speed records. And in fact, we will uh, hear how he wore this watch when he actually perished uh, in, in one of these attempts. Uh, basically, a few months after being knighted, Seagrave attempted to set a water speed record, uh, but on his third pass, the boat crashed in horrifying fashion. These are Mark Kauslarch's words from Odinki, and was pulled from water. Seagrave lived long enough to hear he had broken the record, but died from acute lung hemorrhages. And... Uh, Apparently, this chronograph was actually on his wrist. Um, of course, you are seeing the watch in a rather impeccable condition, which seems unrealistic, uh, except, of course, the watch has been restored not once, but twice by Patek Philippe. Uh, and obviously, that's understandable since pieces from that time period are by no means uh, waterproof. So considering the circumstances, that's only, that's only normal. Um, once again, even though there were versions of the split second chronograph reference 1436 uh, more or less contemporaneously with uh, this watch um, there are only 11 known split seconds single button chronographs apparently made by Patek Philippe uh, two of which were made for Cartier and signed Cartier on the dial And out of those 11 pieces, uh, there are only five in a similar cushion case that you are seeing here. And two of those five are already in the Petit Philippe uh, Museum. So uh, this piece, beyond its specific provenance, is also basically one of the only three examples of its kind that are still publicly available for sale. Apparently, after the watch had been recovered uh, in the aftermath of Seagrave's tragic accident, uh, it was given back to Selfridge, uh, who wore it for a couple of years, but ultimately gave it to Amelia Earhart, who, uh, of course, you would know from her achievements uh, as an aviator, specifically as the first female aviator to fly solo across the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, she was, in fact, Seagrave's wife, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, 
and apparently ultimately Selfridge gave this watch to Amelia Earhart and there was a little bit of an exchange there uh, Amelia Earhart took this watch that belonged to her late husband um, and she gave Selfridge uh, the Longines uh, she was wearing on her record-breaking transatlantic flights. That Longines is now at the Smithsonian Museum in the US, uh, having also flown to the International Space Station um, as another uh, wrinkle in that aviation history that connects these watches with sorry i forgot what i was saying um the dial basically has uh, enamel painted Breguet numerals a round dial in a cushion case uh, that is surrounded by a tachymeter and also is uh, surrounded by decorations the two chronograph registers or the two counters are laid out at 12 o'clock for the 30 minute recorder and for the continuous running seconds at six o'clock and you can see that it has a spade a set of hands fashioned out of stainless steel, including the two chronograph hands um, and beautifully twisted and tapered in the case of the minute hand here that you can, as you can see. Again, what distinguishes this particular chronograph is the fact that it's a single button split second chronograph by Patek Philippe and that it comes in a cushion case of course beyond its provenance that uh, connects it to uh, american uh, wealth uh, motorsports and aviation through the names of selfridge seagrave and uh, Earhart. this is seagrave uh, wearing the watch and this is Amelia Earhart was wearing the same watch years later The watch is inscribed on the case back, uh, marking uh, that initial gift from Henry Gordon Selfred Jr. to the Hay and Seagrave in 1929. And the piece comes with the archival extracts, as well as a number of service invoices by Patek Philippe. It is in yellow gold and the dimensions of the case is 34 by 43. And the estimates given for lot 90 by Monaco Legend Auction is 500,000 to 1 million euro. That was lot 90. I wanted to go back to the Royal Oak Perpetual Calendar that 
I put on my thumbnail, but since we are right there, I also want to share this piece, which is remarkably close to what I like calling the sliced alone. It's the original gold sub, the 1680 slash eight. Uh, and just like Sylvester Stallone's watch that has been profiled in uh, the book, in Matranek's book, A Man and His Watch, it is also one that was retailed by Tiffany and Company and it is signed accordingly on the dial. It is double signed, so to speak, both by Rolex and Tiffany and Company, which retailed the watch. The watch has otherwise a meter's first style, so comes from around 1972. And otherwise the watch is naked, so to speak, presented as it is on a leather strap, on a black leather strap. It has an absolutely beautiful nipple dial that is signed both by Rolex and Tiffany. That was lots 95. For a Rolex Submariner 1680-8 from early 70s, retailed by Tiffany & Company with a pre-auction estimate set within the range between 50,000 to 100,000 euro. Let me know in the chat if you if you can hear me well. Um, if you are having difficulty hearing the sound, please let me know so I can make the necessary adjustments. It should be okay, but sometimes it's not easy to know, to figure out. Here is lot 32. I also wanted to give you a quick look as we are discussing this watch. Um, I wanted to give you a quick look at the reason um, why people call this particular shade of blue on Royal Oak dials, the Yves uh, Klein blue. This is a very particular shade of deep blue, uh, ultramarine. Uh, sometimes it is called, uh, a lot of times, it's simply known as international uh, Klein blue uh, after the uh, French painter Yves Klein, uh, who uh, basically had a very specific supplier in in Paris, in uh, the Montparnasse neighborhood, uh, which provided him uh, this particular mix. It's always said that uh, Yves Klein, as someone who has produced quite prolific prolifically in this monochromatic style of painting, it's it's been said that he was inspired by uh, the particular shade of blue that he was so familiar with from his hometown, uh, from Nice, um, as a blend or intermixing of uh, the blue sky and the blue of the Mediterranean Sea 
uh, at the horizon. And Museum of Modern Arts in New York actually has the 1961 blue monochrome, which they just, I think, restored a few years back. It's something that's very hard to appreciate on a computer screen, of course. However, they did put this very interesting video, which gives you some sense of the texture of the blue monochrome. which perhaps can help you see even better um, as to how at least collectors came with that particular name. Because as you guys know, that sort of um, tapisserie or petit tapisserie pattern is uh, conventionally uh, originally rendered in this uh, midnight blue shade uh, that's somewhere between black and gray uh, and and a deep blue uh, whereas this particular shade of blue that's we sometimes see in certain royal oak models is in fact a very difference, a much more vibrant shade of the color. Thank you, Asus Fo. I appreciate you. Thank you. A member of the channel as well. So you're looking now at a stainless steel version of the AP Royal Oak Perpetual Calendar. already by by the inclusion of the leap year you can have a sense of how how this is a watch that comes uh, roughly after 1995 and in fact the lot listing of this lot number 32 identifies the watch as belonging to year 2000. I believe there is a there's an archival extract involved as well. Right here, the watch belongs to June 6th, 2006. Uh, it is also a classic Royal Oak Cal. Uh, perpetual calendar or QP as coupe uh, as uh, they sometimes like calling it um, which means it comes in a 39 uh, millimeter case that is remarkably similar in terms of its dimensions to the original Royal Oak Jumbo bumping the thickness um, to only about 10 millimeters, which is, of course, still much thicker than the just uh, the time and date version, but quite thin and very wearable for a watch with this kind of complication. Moon phase at 6 o'clock, leap year indicator at 12 o'clock, which is surrounded by an indicator for 
the month. At nine o'clock, you have the day of the week, and three o'clock, you have a pointer date. Petit tapisserie uh, dial in that vibrant shade of blue that goes by the proper name of Yves Klein. And as you can see, the white gold hexagonal bolts that fasten down the octagonal bezel have uh, patinated uh, very pleasantly and warmly, gaining this uh, sort of yellowish hue that uh, I think stands in a very nice contrast to the stainless steel of the octagonal bezel. There's an exhibition case back, which gives us a peek to the now retired caliber 2120 slash 2802. Uh, this uh, belongs to the same lineage of the JLC 920, which powered for generations the Royal Oak Jumbo, hence uh, the relative thinness of this watch as well. Uh, this movement. Uh, presumably is now retired after its final uh, swan song uh, in the limited edition release that was made in collaboration with John Mayer. My assumption is, of course, that means that Audemars Piguet is quite close in their development uh, to releasing a new, uh, presumably again in house, perpetual calendar movement. Uh, and I'm guessing they are building it on the base of the new caliber 71, 70, uh, 7121 that they are using to power the current uh, Royal Oak Jumbo Extra Thin in the catalog, which is 16. 202 reference 16202. I kind of like these uh, open worked and engraved versions of the oscillating weight that puts the initials of the two founding families in stark relief uh, with. Uh, in this sort of gothic font. And there's also a supplemental 21 carats gold weight involved as well. This is lot 32, an Audemars Piguet Royal Oak perpetual calendar in stainless steel with a vibrant blue dial, reference 25820ST. Estimated value of the watch is between 70,000 to 140,000 in euro. Good evening, Whiskey Reaper. Thank you for being here. Thank you for dropping by. Asus Full says, is that AP a stamped dial or real guilloche? Curious if you happen to know. Uh, it's neither Asus Full. Um, I think I can find you the video for that that I had come across years ago on on Hodinki. Um, I think the closest you can the closest you can think of it is like CNC guided Yoshe. But the specific method that is used in producing the Royal Oak uh, tapisserie dials, um, especially the Petit Tapisserie, is uh, called the pantograph, which basically uh, is a machine that carves a smaller, more compact version of a pattern. Uh, that is given to it. You know, it traces that larger pattern and cuts it 
on a smaller example. And here's the video that Hodinki had published a while ago. Um, let's see. So it traces the pattern from there and carves it right there. So I hope that clarifies it. I do appreciate uh, that video that was posted uh, by Hodinki, I think more than a decade ago now. But the system has nothing to do with stamping. Uh, it does involve, as you can see, um, as a particular technique of guilloche that involves machines and not a hand-guided uh, rose engine in this particular case. No worries, my friend. This is, uh, this is why we are here. This is why I'm here, to learn together and share what little I happen to know. Uh, another classic right here, and a perennial favorite, always as we are heading into Watches and Wonders. Every year, almost, there is a rumor about a new GMT Master release. Uh, oftentimes, it's about just a new Cerachrome bezel that combines two unique colors or renders something that has been done before. This year, I've heard rumors that were tinged with uh, the release of a new GMT Master series altogether, uh, with perhaps newly designed cases uh, and the addition of the Coke bezel. I don't think anything like that is happening. Um, I do believe they are going to add uh, another bezel color bezel combination to the stainless steel line but i have a sense that they will just uh, import uh, that tone on tone uh, configuration they used in the new uh, two-tone gmt master that uh, people came to call the guinness i don't think the coke bezel is coming uh, but I know that people want it all the time. I have uh, this watch, actually a very similar one, from the later parts of the same decades. Uh, this watch apparently is roughly dated to 1991. Um, mine is more from around 1997. It's a very handsome looking watch and I I actually much prefer this particular combination black and red um, especially as it ages and what we have here is a box product literature, I think uh, what looks like the original receipt, an additional link, presentation box and, and outer packaging too. Of course, as you can see, the 16.7.110 uh, was basically a more streamlined uh, version 
of uh, the GMT Master to uh, the new movement that allows the correction or or adjustment of time uh, with the jumping of the hour hand was initially introduced in 16760 which had a thicker case due to that uh, initial version of the movement which was thicker uh, that's why sometimes the 167 60 is called uh, quote unquote fat lady or Sophia Loren, uh, whereas the 16710 is the more streamlined, modernized version of, um, of the GMT Master 2 from this five digit era. Um, they, there are many different kinds of the same watch, I have to say, in the sense that you can. Uh, you can find them with tritium dials. You can find them with uh, solid end link bracelets as you uh, go uh, to the time period right at the threshold of the turn into the millennium. Of course, super luminova dials uh, follow. And, you know, you get... It's one of those references, much like... Uh, the 14060, uh, much like uh, 16570, uh, the Explorer 2, where you get the best of both worlds, when, when you can even get to mix and match, right? You know, you can get uh, a tritium dial in what uh, is a watch that is largely uh, a modern feel, even though it's, of course, quite different than the Rolex watches today. Um, and you can even, towards the end of the production period, you can even get examples of this uh, with the no-holes case, which some people prefer aesthetically. For me, it's quite the opposite, actually. I really like the holes case uh, versions of these sorts of Rolex professional watches from the time period when they had aluminum bezels because it's just simply much more modular and to me it also aesthetically conveys an idea of that utilitarian ethos that uh, these watches represented mr ghost says Let's figure out if it's this or next year, it's GMT's 70th anniversary on Hodinki and Watchbox. It says 1955 and on Revolution and other sites, it says 1954. I believe it's 1954. The reason that... Um, the reason uh, as to why there is uh, such confusion usually, Mr. Ghost, is because of the release schedules, right? Sometimes these kinds of models are were announced a year ahead of time, but, or designed, patented, uh, I shouldn't say patented because patent usually actually comes later, uh, years after the release oftentimes. But they, they end up being designed and conceived in a certain year, and then they might be represented in, uh, in the trade show, which was at the time Basel, and then uh, it gets delivered uh, maybe a year later. Uh, it starts hitting, to sh hitting the shelf a year later people uh, do the same thing sometimes for for the submariner as well right uh, they try to say oh you know the rolex submariner wasn't actually released in 1953 but 54 and i think a lot of the time uh, the confusion has either something honest um, about it in the sense that people get confused because of seemingly contradictory sources of information 
Um, or uh, sometimes when it comes to watches that also have a certain historical claim, uh, like being the first dive watch, and, and you know my friend uh, Jose Perez, uh, Periscope, who uh, shared with you the story of the first true dive watch here. Uh, sometimes it's it's disinformation, right? And the either to legitimate a brand's own claim for being the first and the best, or other times it's a lie propagated by the rival brands to take away um, that sort of claim of, of being the first or being an early example. Um, I wanted to share that video I did with, with Jose. Yes, deep dives with Periscope. That's that's what we have, and that was the story of the first modern dive watch. Um, look, I, I think, yeah, I think we're splitting hairs. I, I think Rolex follows the date 1954 more than, more than anything. I've always thought of it as 1954. So we were looking at this early 90s example at lot 33 of the Rolex GMT Master with the Coke bezel reference 16710. And the pre-auction estimate for this piece is set within the range between 7,000 to 14,000 in euro Um, Ozzy, quickly, uh, because this is something that needs an entire episode, uh, and I would love to do something like that with someone like Jose, who would probably be, be the best interlocutor that I could ever wish. Uh, but the Submariner uh, basically built on uh, Rolex's history and aspiration of making waterproof pieces. Uh, so the kind of Oyster Perpetual watches uh, that were sent to the Italian uh, expedition that uh, Jose Perez Periscope documents 
uh, on his website. Um, that was the reference 6098. And uh, René Paul uh, Jeanneret, uh, who was the right hand man at the time of Hans Wilsdorf, and himself uh, quite a competent uh, scuba diver, um, played the main part, uh, as I understand it, in designing the Rolex Submariner. So the idea was basically using the uh, oyster perpetual uh, pieces as a base, as a foundation to develop something that is more appropriate for professional diving and also for, for scuba diving. And I think probably it was Jean Ray's, um pet project. But yeah, uh, Jose's article is, is great. Um, he talks about how Bruno Vailati and, and his fellow divers, uh, when they went on this expedition that they filmed, um, Sesto Continente, which is actually the first full length, full color, uh, underwater documentary in, in history. So I, I'll drop the link now in the chat, um, Aussie, and you can take a look at it. Mr. Ghost, thank you for, for the correction in that case. I've always known it as 1954. Mr. Ghost says, I looked at the Rolex homepage and it says, as the successor to the model presented in 1955 and adopted by airline pilots, GMT Master 2 has become the ultimate cosmopolitan watch. Thank you for the correction. Well, since uh, since you mentioned, we should look at the GMT Master One, perhaps uh, at the four four digit reference if they have one. If not, no, they don't actually have it. Well, we will we'll continue right here. Lot 2 is a stainless steel AP chronograph from the long discontinued line UTM, uh, which was kind of a round-cased watch with a more modern or contemporary feel. I really like uh, the way these cases are actually finished. Uh, they very much employ the kind of finishing techniques that AP has always been known for and that puts in close proximity that juxtaposes surfaces that are grain brushed and mirror polished. Um, the chronographs are, I think, a particular, particularly nice uh, deployment of these designs. This is an example in stainless steel. The reference number is 25644ST. The case size, the case diameter is right around 40 millimeters. Uh, and I find it like a very 90s watch. Uh, and it's it has its own way of displaying the kind of obnoxiousness than, that an AP watch, uh, that AP has always done really well, I think, uh, at least 
in in their more modern era. Uh, the overbranding I find a particular delight. Of course, there's the brand signature, uh, there's the initial, uh, there's also an engraved uh, signature of the brand at around 12 o'clock on the bezel. Uh, I also like the layout of the chronograph, the 6, 9, 12, and the sequence of the chronograph counters is also fairly uh, unique in this case, where you have the 12 hour counter at six, uh, 30 minute totalizer at nine, and the continuous running seconds at 12. And of course you have um, as an entirely stainless steel heat blued handset, you also have uh, the chronograph seconds uh, centrally deployed as well. You have a date, uh, at three o'clock with an inverted magnifier and a uh, tachymeter is actually inscribed on the perimeter of the dial. The pushers are in the style of pump pushers, but they're very subtle, very discreet. And again, I like the uh, case shape as well as its finish. The lugs are quite elegant. And again, the design of the case is actually very classical, even though the proportions are much more modern, much more contemporary, uh, as they are actually right around 40 millimeters and maybe like a smidgen over. One second. I was so scared. I do this all the time. I, I put my water in the freezer and then I forget I thought it burst, so I had to quickly, um, quickly go and and check on it. These pieces were also offered in a number of different metals and combinations. I think the two-tone version that combines a tantalum case with pink gold details uh, in a way that extends even to the dial is quite beautiful. And so is the platinum one, which has a very nice blue dial. Let me see if I can, if I can find uh, quickly some photographs of the two um, pieces of the two uh, variations. Here's the 25644TR. As you can see, it uses a tantalum case and really um, layers uh, 
those pink gold accents quite consciously in a very calculated manner, uh, both on the case and on the dial, to have used that interplay throughout. And I think I'm having a hard time finding this particular piece, but there has to be, yeah. Unfortunately, I couldn't find one that is at hand, but there's an example that is in platinum, which is of course a white metal in the picture and a matte blue dial as well. Thank you, Mr. Ghost, for reminding everyone to upvote. The stainless steel example, of course, is um, much more uh, reasonably priced on the secondary market. I think, you know, if you are patient, if you are chasing a watch like this, if you are chasing the twenty-five six forty-four, the UTM uh, chronograph, uh, which is is, by the way, uh, based on the Frédéric Piguet caliber 1185. Um, if you're patient enough, I think there's so many good deals to come by when it comes to a watch like this. Yes, it is AP. Yes, it is, to a certain extent, still quite desirable. Uh, but ultimately, uh, it's not really, and it never was, the hottest Audemars Piguet watch. So there are always great deals to find. I find that tantalum pink gold version certainly the most unique and interesting. Uh, the platinum version might not be worth the premium, and the stainless steel version is certainly um, the most affordable, as you can see here at lots two. Uh, the pre-auction estimates is in the range between 4,000 to 8,000 in euro. Lot number four is a Patek Philippe uh, Calatrava that is made for the opening of uh, Pisa Orologeria in Milan for the opening of their uh, boutique in 2008. It was made apparently in pink gold and in white gold, each in a limited run of 25 examples. This is one of the 25 white gold versions. 30, 38 millimeters in diameter. And it's actually marked on the exhibition case back as a limited edition for Pisa Orologeria with the specific number of the watch as well as the year of inauguration. Of course, year 2008, that means this piece still bears the hallmark of Geneva on the bridge of its movements. And the dial itself is quite pretty uh, with <clears throat> with the white gold reggae numerals. That are 
set against a polished chapter ring and the red accents give the watch quite a unique uh, feel right for every five minutes they alternate with polished gold beads as well uh, as the sweep center second hand that is represented in red aces full thank you so much towards the h2o fund i will get a lot of different bottles of water with that thank you so much aces full i appreciate you thank you enjoying your thoughtful content thank you for your contribution this piece comes as a full set and in a very nice condition as well as much as the pictures can attest the hallmarks are pretty crisp so the watch certainly that has not seen any significant polishing and again with all my enmity uh, towards date windows i still have to say that this is a very handsome looking watch uh, i would have liked it better i think with a uh, preguet numeral at three as well but i can see uh, why in this particular case two again i like that two-tone dial right with the way that the polished polished chapter ring for the hour track contrasts with the more matte uh, center dial and the red accents are certainly very unique and give a very interesting distinction to what is otherwise a very classic conservative looking watch this is lot number four for a limited edition patek philippe calatrava 5296 uh, one of 25 pieces in white gold produced for the inauguration of pisa orologeria in milan and the estimated value of the piece is set within the range between 20,000 to 40,000 in euro. Lot 8 is quite interesting. I don't think uh, we see many of these uh, kinds of uh, pieces and certainly the opinion i'm sure will be divided because you're looking at uh 116 500 but it's matched with a bracelet and a dial that is not common to the stainless steel watch at all of course the oyster bracelet too comes with the watch which should uh, allay some of the fears But the dial, too, is that silver panda dial that I think came with the 116519, the white gold on Oyster Flex.
honestly, I think it's an interesting look. Uh, it would not be my first choice. I would not want to go after a watch like this, but I have to say it, it looks kind of interesting. And with that particular dial in combination with The Jubilee bracelet, I really feel it has a slightly retro kind of vibe. You know, not not true vintage, but maybe like a neo vintage feel to it. And yes, at the end of the day, at least it comes with the Oyster Bracelet as well. Um, so it's it's certainly a different flavor. Uh, however, the estimated value of the piece for this auction at lot eight is by no means um, reasonable or um, it cannot really act as an incentive, let's put it like that because the pre-auction estimate in this case is between 20,000 to 40,000 US dollars. I meant to say Euro. Yeah, honestly, I don't know what to think. I don't know what to think about that watch. I just wanted to bring it to your attention because it seems just very adventurous and I don't I don't see why they included watches like that. There was another watch. I forgot what it was now, but there was another watch like this in this auction while I was examining it while I was looking at it earlier in the day. To share with you, I saw a watch that was similarly kind of modified. Hmm. Okay, I'm confused now. I do want to share that now that I actually thought of it. Hmm. Ah, yes, it was, it was towards the end. It was like a stainless steel Daytona with the Tokwa's Daytona Beach dial. Lot 174. This is the 116520. So the first generation of self-winding Rolex Daytonas with the in-house movement with the caliber 4130. The stainless steel version with uh, the Tokwa's dial that is probably harvested uh, from a Daytona Beach piece which, as you guys know, are the 116519 um, rendered in white gold and presented on lizard skin straps that echo with the color of the dial. Yeah, I don't quite get it. I don't quite get why uh, in this particular auction Monaco Legends uh, went for, you know, putting up these kinds of pieces.
pieces that are clearly uh, customized. But the story that they put together with it in this case is that this unique customization was possibly made by a special request by a very important customer of the boutique, which again, I mean, yeah, sure. <laughs> cool story, bro, as they as they say. I, I'm I mean, I don't get it. I don't get it. Because at the end of the day, You know, who cares? I mean, by all means, you know, play around with and customize your own watch in any way you please. But whether these kinds of oddball watches um, without any substantiation, without any kind of pop, uh, paperwork turning up uh, at prestigious auction houses, is just an odd event. It, it just begs the question, you know, why why do it at all? This is lot 174, a stainless steel Rolex Daytona from before the introduction of the ceramic bezels. So the reference number is 116520, stainless steel with the matching tachometer bezel uh, with a turquoise Daytona Beach dial. The pre-auction estimate is set between 20,000 to 40,000 euro. There's a very interesting, simple Danny Roth dress watch from the 90s at lot 170. Classic double ellipse. case, also called the Ellipso Curvex, coming from the late 90s period. Of course, this is um, not necessarily from the true independent era of Daniel Roth. It belongs to that period of time where the brand was owned by the Singapore-based company, the Hourglass. Quite a storied dealer uh, in that part of the world still. They shifted the production more towards pieces that, that were oriented towards the everyday, more utilitarian, uh, Practical complications like uh, GMT, self-winding chronograph, and a lot of stainless steel watches as well. Uh, that doesn't mean they had stopped. That doesn't mean Daniel Roth had stopped making precious metal watches at the time. And this is one such example. The reference is 207J. It's a self-winding dress watch in yellow gold, 30 by 34 millimeters in diameter. With a self-winding movement.
the watch comes with a presentation box that mimics the shape of the case as well as its outer packaging and some product literature. And the piece has a beautiful two-tone gray dial with a kind of anthracite gray pinstripe guilloche backdrop and a more silvered chapter ring that has Breguet frosting with Roman numerals as our markers. And just as you would see in a Breguet dress watch, every single sector of the dial is framed beautifully with that sort of coin edged finishing. And you can even see that um, through the two rings that frame the seconds track on the subdial. And the hands, of course, are fashioned out of stainless steel and heat blues. This is lot 170 for a Daniel Roth self-winding dress piece with small seconds in yellow gold. The piece has a pre-auction pre estimates between 10,000 to 20,000 in euro. At 169, we have a 5167R, an Aquanaut Jumbo in pink gold with that sunburst chocolate brown dial. The piece uh, apparently comes from around late 2019 and with an additional tropic style rubber strap which i believe is black all of the documents as well as product literature even the leather bifold wallets to hold the documents is included. However, the box that comes with it is a travel box and not the proper presentation box that goes with this watch. Even with, with the way that the hype uh, is arguably relatively died down, of course, Patek Philippe sports watches in stainless steel, in precious metal, uh, just with the time and date or with complications, still command a significant premium on the markets. And this particular lot listing reflects that accordingly. Uh, lot 169 has an estimated value that is set between 50,000 to 100,000 in euro. At 165, 
we have one of my favorite versions of the Daytona. And on the secondary markets, if not necessarily on this particular listing, in this particular lot, this piece is also a great deal. There are many reasons uh, behind my particular affection for this piece. One was because it was advertised with uh, Roger Federer at the time. It's a white gold version on the matching oyster bracelets and with uh, what they call uh, a racing dial, which means that it has Arabic numerals as its hour markers that are radially arrayed around the dial. And uh, that dial, uh, true to that uh, racing uh, reference, through to that evocation of racing, also has beautiful red uh, accents, beautiful red details against uh, the backdrop of a black dial. Um, and those include, of course, uh, the graduations of all the chronograph registers, as well as the second track, not to mention the chronograph hands themselves, including the centrally deployed chronograph second hand. The pieces otherwise every bit uh, of that generation of the Daytona, the generation with the in-house movement caliber 4130 that was introduced in the Basel Fair of 2000. Again, white gold on a matching bracelet with a black racing dial that has eye-catching pie red accents. This particular piece does come as a full set, box papers, product literature, as well as the outer packaging. This particular example is apparently from around 2005, 2006. At lot 165, this Rolex Cosmograph Daytona, reference 116519, has an estimated value between 24,000 to 48,000 euro. And again, uh, as I mentioned, this particular valuation uh, is not particularly attractive to, to me. You know, remember, uh, there's a buyer's premium involved, there are taxes involved, and more. I'd much rather uh, go into the secondary market and get one in decent condition. Um, and I'm sure you can easily negotiate a price that's under uh, $40,000, probably more around thirty-five dollars uh, for a similar piece like that um, any day of the week. And you can find it cheaper too, don't take me wrong. Uh, but again, this is... This is quite a decent, a decent deal for this particular genre. And the most recent version of the 116509 uh, with the blue dial that was introduced along with the stainless steel ceramic bezel versions uh, in, I think that was 20... Was it 2015? Uh, 
the 116500 LN was introduced in 2015 or 2016? Maybe 2016. Anyway, that, that's a great watch as well. And I think relatively a good deal too when it when you compare it especially to the so-called John Mayer, right? To the 116508. There's a very nice classic pink gold Rolex Stay Date here. We're looking at the Monaco Legends exclusive timepieces auction. This is going to take place as a live event in Monte Carlo on April 20th and 21st. I'm going to send the link once again into the chat. If you want me to highlight any particular lots, you should feel absolutely free to send in the lot number with a super chat, and I would be more than happy to shine a particular light on that watch and discuss it as much horological and historical detail as I can muster. Uh, and as you guys know, this channel uh, covering as it does uh, a great variety of news, updates, and information from all corners of the industry uh, is not sponsored or supported by any auction houses. Um, I'm not uh, on in the books of, of a gray market dealer either. Uh, so I'm not trying to sell you anything. Um, I am at complete liberty to speak my mind and uh, share with you what little I know, learn with you, uh, and inform you so that you can ultimately get the best uh, deal for yourself, armed with knowledge, so that you can get uh, best value for your money on the secondary market and in retail um, so ultimately that independence allows me to serve you the best but it also means i am at your behest and this is something that uh, starting may 15 i'll be doing uh, full time so any uh, support that you can give the channel uh, whether it's through the options that YouTube provides you or um, through the links that are provided uh, by me in the video description. I would very much appreciate that. And of course, uh, the channel memberships uh, do give you exclusive access to an archive of content uh, that keeps uh, growing week by week. You're looking at the classic uh, 1803 Rolex day dates here in pink gold, presented, mounted on its matching president style bracelets. Pardon me. The piece also has a pie pan style silver dial that is diamond set uh, for the hour markers where baguette cut diamonds alternates uh, with brilliant cuts diamonds. Of course, when it comes to this particular generation, the 1803, pink gold examples are much more rare compared to yellow gold examples. And they're also quite beautiful, quite precious indeed.
oftentimes when it comes to these diamond set dials, it's usually at the baguette cut diamonds are usually at six o'clock and nine o'clock. Here they alternate with brilliant cuts, which seems to me to be a very unique arrangement, very rare, I should say, if not necessarily unique to this watch. And the watch, as you may have guessed, uh, is naked, which means it arrives with um, without any sort of documentation, no box or papers. This is lot 161. For a Rolex day date in pink gold, presented on its matching pink gold president bracelets, and with a silvered dial that is set with diamonds for our markers where baguette cut diamonds and diamonds a uh, brilliant cut diamonds alternates the pre-auction estimate of this piece at lot 165 is between 25,000 to 50,000 euro At lot 153, we have the classic Patek Philippe uh, Perpetual Calendar Chronograph here in white gold, the 3970 EG. The piece, as you can see from this close-up, has an Italian calendar. The piece has a black dial with those multifaceted obus shaped indices, which is slightly unusual for this reference in white gold because usually those pieces, the examples of 3917 white gold, either come with silver dials um, or with diamond set indices, whereas this one has a black dial with those obus shaped R markers. Italian calendar, as I mentioned, with a beautifully preserved case where you can see all the contours of those unique claw-like stepped lugs. Of course, the particular delight or highlight of this watch is uh, the movement that is built on the base of the classic chronograph uh, blank, uh, Lemania CH27, which here bears the hallmark of Geneva on its balance bridge. Of course, assembled, regulated and finished in classic Patek Philippe uh, fashion with distinctive, with its distinctive uh, cap uh, on the column wheel. Of course, the piece comes with an additional matching solid gold case back if you just want that extra heft rather than uh, contemplating the movement. Uh, 
And by the way, that black dial is original to the watch as it is noted on the certificate of origin. Uh, I had mentioned that it was unique, uh, but certificate of origin also confirms that this watch has left the manufacturer with that particular dial as well. And here it comes with uh, all these accessories pictured in this photograph. This is lot 153 for a classic Patek Philippe uh, perpetual calendar chronograph with a moon phase and leap year indicator, Italian calendar, black dial with obus shaped markers in a 36 millimeter white gold case. This particular piece has an estimated value set within the range between 100,000 to 200,000 in euro. You remember we had looked at one particular version of the UTM and I had uh, the UTM chronograph at lot two and I particularly had lauded uh, the excessive uh, branding of the watch. This is the same watch, same reference number 25644. But this particular piece has a black dial and actually has a graduated bezel, still a fixed bezel, that marks each interval with Arabic numerals, 0 to 60. Once again, in stainless steel, this is the Audemars Piguet UTM chronograph at lot 148 with a pre-auction estimate between 5,000 to 10,000 euro. At 149, we have a very interesting and beautiful uh, Audemars Piguet open worked pocket watch. The piece is in white gold and is 42 millimeters in diameter. It comes from 1960s and with uh, a matching chain as well. And as you can see, the piece has a sectorial engraved bezel, as you can see from those notches that actually align perfectly with similar notches that mark the indices on the chapter ring. The dial is handsomely open worked and so is the rest of the movements as you can see here from behind. 
This is a white gold pocket watch by Audemars Piguet from the 60s at lot 149. The estimated value of the piece is between 6,000 to 12,000 euro. At lot 147, there's a very interesting and rare example of a yellow gold Patek Philippe Nautilus Jumbo. And quite frankly, uh, the a yellow gold version of the jumbo is rare enough and quite desirable in its own way. But of course, the Omani Hanjar that adorns the six o'clock uh, in gold of this watch's dial makes it even more unique. Of course, when it comes to these kinds of uh, symbols, double signatures, uh, coats of arms, and other uh, markings on the dial, you have to most certainly, minimally, go with some sort of paperwork some sort of paper trail that establishes the authenticity of the watch uh, that confirms the watch left uh, the manufacturer uh, with that signature, with that stamping, with that marking on the dial. And in this case, uh, the extract of extract from the archives by Patek Philippe actually confirms the black rib dial with yellow gold indices, uh, tritium, luminous material, and the coat of arms. The piece was manufactured in 1977, sold on November 23rd of 1978. And the archival extract itself comes from January 29th, 2021. It's, uh, 3700 line one in 18 karat yellow gold case and integrated bracelets with the Omani symbol of the Hanjar, the traditional dagger superimposed on two crossed swords. Hi, Patek Chris. Nice to see you here. Um, as the lot essay also notes, a similar piece uh, was recently sold by Christie's on November 6, 2023, at the Passion for Time uh, auction. You will remember uh, the initial excitement and later the controversy that surrounded that single owner. Uh, collection by uh, Mohammed Zaman, uh, but finally, uh, they the two sides had come to an agreement, and a similar uh, yellow gold Nautilus with the Omani Hanjar uh, was part of that uh, curation as well, and it sold at the time for more than one million one hundred. Swiss francs. Uh, so this is a particularly promising lot 
for the Monaco Legend auction that's coming up in less than a month as well. And for lot 147, the pre-auction estimate that Monaco Legends uh, auction came up with is between 500,000 to 1 million euro. At 146, we have one of my favorite uh, complications from Patrick Philippe's back catalog. Of course, there are still watches uh, that represent the juxtaposition of the annual calendar with the chronograph. Um, today, the 5205 is one series like that. The 5961, which is essentially just like the 5960, but with a diamond set bezel, uh, is also still part of the lineup, but uh, all the other uh, references of the 5960 family in all its variations, including all shades of gold, uh, stainless steel mounted on the bracelet, and the platinum version that you currently see has been discontinued. The platinum was actually the first one to be introduced in 2006. That was both the 10th anniversary of uh, Patek's annual calendar complication, which was a world first for Patek. Uh, and it was also uh, a first for Patek uh, in 2006 because they also used the 5960P to introduce their new in-house integrated self-winding chronograph movement with the flyback function. Um, I know I, a lot of people think I'm, I'm exaggerating uh, a little bit, but to me, the 5960, uh, for its combination of uh, these two marvelous complications uh, and in an everyday wearable and relatively accessible way, um, is almost uh, like a 1518 for a new age for me in terms of, in terms of what it represents. Uh, and when it comes to today's market of Patek Philippe watches, it's also one of those pieces that offer a pretty interesting deal as well. And the other thing that I really like about this particular piece, this particular reference number, is how every single uh, variation of it has almost a completely different feel, right? It's not just the case material that changes, but uh, the very styling of the watch. Uh, and again, it's, it's beyond just changing the dial color of the watch because uh, honestly, this is a very different watch compared to the 5960 Line 1A um, with the white dial, which is then a different watch from 5960G, uh, which is styled almost like a pilot's watch and uh, has, has different pushers that harken back uh, to Patek's uh, classic 1463. Uh, the Tasti Tondi uh, with the round pushers that have this sort of conical top that has a guilloche finish. Anyway, long story short, I love this lineup. Uh, the 5960, 
I find to be um, one of the best uh, for sure. And the fact that it's the first and the fact that it has this stunning uh, silver starburst style has a lot to do with that. The calendrical functions are laid out between 10 to 2 o'clock uh, through three asymmetrical uh, windows. There's also a plus minus sign as a power reserve indicator at 12 o'clock right above the signature of the brand. And there's a single chronograph register at 6 o'clock, which has at its innermost circle a 12-hour counter as well as a day and night indicator that you can glimpse through a portal-like opening. And in two concentric circles, it also has a 60-minute totalizer uh, that wraps itself around the hour counter, recording minutes uh, 0 to 30 in its outermost circle, 30 to 60 uh, in a concentric circle. Of course, these are the three pushers for the quick correction of the date, day, and month. You have a quick look. At the CH27520, the watch, of course, comes with a matching platinum deployant clasp, and it is presented. on a leather strap, comes with the full set of its original accessories, including the certificate of origin. And it, this example comes from November of 2006, so it's a pretty early one. Patek Chris says, 5060's release was very timely indeed, given the annual calendar patent ran out in 2006, 10 years following the introduction, exactly. So combining an annual calendar with the chronograph, self-winding with the flyback function was a way to stay ahead. Patek Chris says 5960 lineup is arguably still alive in the catalog with the 5961 models, as I mentioned. Um, yeah, I mean, they, they're fine. But the feel, again, as I said, in praise uh, to these pieces, uh, they're very different from each other. Right? This watch becomes quite a different beast. I mean... It's easy to demonstrate when you have baguette cut diamonds that adorn its its bezel, right? It's still a stunning watch, but it's not necessarily everyone's cup of tea. And of course, it doesn't really help uh, that those baguette cut diamonds push the price way into six figures i think it's like 160,000 or something like that that's that's a lot that's a lot of money even for the kind of watch you are getting and and yeah i agree that it's it's a lot of watch for the money it is a watch that uh, is in many ways ahead of the competition when it comes to uh when you compare it to watches uh, from 
Patek's competitors. Yeah, I think I think fifty nine sixty is my preference. To the fifty nine sixty one, to the fifty two oh five that is still in the catalog, and it is a relatively. Um, I mean, it's it's a good deal as well. Uh, so I'm I don't mourn the absence of fifty nine sixty from the lineup now, because on the secondary market it is actually quite an attractive deal. Um, yeah, the white gold with the blue dial, or uh, the stainless steel version on the bracelet with the white dial are my personal favorites this piece comes with the full set of its accessories apparently it is from the personal collection of renato del valle And at lot 146, estimated value of the watch is between 30 to 60,000 euro. And Patek Chris says, yes, with the 5961, you are on the brink of the 5270 in yellow gold right and of course 5270 is the perpetual calendar chronograph um with those beautiful yeah with that beautiful case with stepped spider lugs and everything so there's a lot to love in that piece as well but that chris says i love the 5905 but 59 uh, 60 is a modern classic. There's so many iterations. It's really a matter of what appeals to you. Yeah, you're right on point. You're right on point. A very interesting 6542. We were just talking about the origins of the GMT Master model, the whole uh, confusion or controversy about its actual uh, year of release, which apparently is 1955, even though uh, the watch was born or at least I always thought it was born in 1954 uh, through the commission of, of Pan Am. Uh, this is the original uh, reference, 6542. And it has that early example of the plastic, uh, of the Bakelite bezel in those iconic uh, blue and red colors. The dial is quite unique in an in and of its own regards with the depth rating and the red 
JMD master writing. The 24 hour hand, as you can see, is also red with a small arrow. And apparently, this particular piece was actually owned by Gonzalo Guell y Morales de los Rios, a lawyer, politician, and diplomat who served as Cuban Minister of Foreign Affairs and uh, also as Prime Minister. The piece is accordingly engraved on the case bag for Gonzalo Guell, 1958. It does come on its original riveted oyster bracelet with the pictures of Gonzalo Guell, as well as a Rolex service receipt from Havana that is made out to Gonzalo Guell, made out in his name. This is lot 140 for a Rolex GMT Master reference 6542 with a Bakelite bezel and a very distinctive dial with red writing, formerly property of Gonzalo Guell, Minister of Foreign Affairs and Prime Minister of Cuba. The piece has a pre-auction estimate set between 250,000 to 500,000 US dollars. Patek, Chris, thank you so much. Eight ninety nine New Zealand dollars. I would like to get a current GMT for my wedding anniversary next month. Thoughts on the current catalog? Um, great question. I think you know. I say this quite begrudgingly as a. Uh, as a fanboy of the Submariner, above and beyond any other uh, Rolex piece. I do also have a number of other Rolex watches. I am admittedly a bigger fan of, of the vintage and new vintage periods, four digit and five digit references. But in the current catalog, probably GMT Master 2 is where Rolex shines. I think it had received an extra boost in the modern era, in the contemporary era, with uh, the earlier introduction of ceramic bezels, um, the colorful, uh, bicolor, 24-hour uh, uh, bezel inserts, I think especially had something to do with its popularity and Rolex, I think, re leveraged really well those minute cosmetic differences from one year to another um, to propagate uh, that hype. Um, I have to be honest with you, Chris, I, I never, I never liked the modern Pepsi. I think the colors are never quite right and a little too loud for me, uh, but I do like the BLNR, right? I like the black and blue bezel. I do like the uh, so-called Sprite. Um, if I were you, I would probably go for 
a stainless steel, especially if it's an, an easy allocation or a relatively easy allocation for you to get. I would probably want to wait also. Uh, you did say next month anyways, but I would want to wait to see what comes out of um, Geneva, what comes out of Watches and Wonders, um, just because pardon me, because I do believe that there's going to be uh, a new stainless steel GMT Master, a new bezel color for the stainless steel GMT Master, I want to say. Um, but, you know, I would... Yeah, I think black and blue is great, green and black is great. If you if you don't necessarily um, mind the lefty configuration, and to be fair, I want to. I want to say the modern one, I still prefer on the Oyster. Uh, of course, the Polish center links still make the watch overall quite flashy and, and very eye-catching, which perhaps you might like and enjoy better than I do. Um, I think the modern GMTs on the Jubilee bracelet as well become too shiny for my taste i think it's a little too much so if you can get any of the models on an oyster bracelet i would go for that uh, with my personal favorites being the blnr so my choice would be one two six seven one oh blnr uh, on the oyster bracelet Wow, that's great. Yeah, well, then then you have the hookup. That's great. Mitchell. Nice to see you, man. I remember you. I remember you. That's great. It's nice to see you in the chat. Um, and I'm glad we, we agree. I'm glad we are on the same page. You have the uh, Bleu Rouge, uh, so the Pepsi on the Jubilee, and you bought a spare oyster precisely because the Jubilee was a disco ball. Just couldn't do it. But in either case, wear it in great health, as Chris wished you. And Chris, um, that's a beautiful anniversary gift for your wife as well. Hopefully, both of you guys will get to wear your anniversary Rolex pieces in great health and wealth. Thank you again for your contribution. Attack Chris, and also thank you uh, for the earlier contribution, Ace is full. Um, I have a long day tomorrow, so I have about maybe 20 minutes or so, maybe a little longer. But I will try to share with you uh, maybe three or four more pieces one thirty six is one of my favorite Patek Philippe pieces uh, again of uh, relatively recent time. I mean these watches are of course no longer 
in the catalog, but they still belong to the 21st century. They were launched in 2003, have a beautiful rectangular shape uh, with quite sensual curvature, I have to say. I also love the stepped flanks of the case, which really go to accentuate the uh, Art Deco design influences of this particular wristwatch. Um, I really like this combination of, of the gray dial with the pink gold case. And the gray is very distinctive. You know, I this from this particular dial color, I sometimes get a certain khaki green military fatigue uh, kind of shade uh, in certain kinds of lighting and 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 angles. Uh, this is of course a Tobion wristwatch. Uh, I love that that fact and that the fact that it comes with a 10 day power reserve uh, in traditional Patek style of course the tourbillon cage is not displayed on the dial side the watch is simply signed as tourbillon with uh, the movement number uh, here that signature is in uh, the small second sub dial at six which is counterposed with a power reserve indicator for 10 days at 12 o'clock. Applied Breguet numerals that match uh, the pink gold tones of the case, paired with leaf-shaped uh, hands for the hour and minutes. The watch also has a beautiful Patek tank buckle. It does come with its original documents, which dated back to December 2009. This was someone's Christmas gift about 15 years ago. And here is a good look at that movement with a stunning tourbillon cage. Of course, the Geneva hallmark is likewise present on the movement. I like the fact that this movement was designed for the case form-fitted, rectangular for a rectangular watch, as it should be, of course, but that's not always the case. This is lot 136 for an Art Deco-styled Tourbillon wristwatch by Patek Philippe uh, in 18 karat pink gold with that lovely uh, gray slash khaki green dial the case has those distinctive stepped flanks its dimensions are 30 by 51.5 millimeter the reference number is 5101r this particular example comes with the warranty book uh, that is displayed in those pictures. And the pre-auction estimates is somewhere between 90,000 to 180,000 euro. That was lot 136 for a Patek Philippe 5101R. If you have any uh, 
any watch related questions if you want to make any contributions um, again this is the last 15 minutes um, every little bit helps and i'm already grateful for your support and presence please hit the like button that always helps share the link to the channel with other enthusiasts and fellow watch collectors that uh, will help us expand this community that comes together uh, around knowledge of and passion for wristwatches. The only goal of this channel uh, is to enrich uh, the knowledge of wristwatches for everyone involved so you can get the best value for your money at retail and on the secondary markets. Uh, and so we can share and grow uh, the kind of passion and emotional connection we have for these timepieces uh, beyond uh, just uh, our more exclusive groups. So we have about 15 minutes. I think I can probably discuss three more pieces let's talk about this beautiful zenith daytona yay mrs patek is excited about the new uh, daytona 126 500 ln right with the white dial that's that's a great watch the daytonas especially the white dial daytonas um and you don't necessarily have to go precious metal or two-tone they look great on a woman's wrist. It's it's just the way it is. I mean, they look great on a man's wrist as well, don't take me wrong. Um, but the classic uh, proportions and design elements of uh, the Rolex Daytona makes it very attractive as a unisex uh, proposition as well. In fact, I made a video uh, about that um, at a certain point in time. Uh, let's see if I can quickly locate it. Yeah, it's it's called Rolex Daytona, the best unisex watch. So feel free to check it out. Uh, Mitchell says, thanks and good memory. Happy to be back. Great content. Been watching from afar. Yes, that's what I remembered. But of course, I'm not going to. I'm not going to blow your cover, Mitchell. But I do remember that you're watching from far. Everybody, please hit the like button. That really helps. Uh, we are looking at one of my favorite versions of the Daytona. Of course, I'm not going to start comparing it to some of the classic, iconic, hand-wound, vintage references. But to me, this first generation uh, of self-winding Daytonas uh, that were built on the base of the Zenith El Primero caliber 400, what Rolex rehearsed as caliber 4030, are uh, modern classics. First and foremost, I really like the aesthetics of this watch. Uh, it's, as I mentioned, it's classical dimensions and proportions to be sure, but also the beautiful balance uh, of the dial where uh, the two chronograph registers, namely the 30 minute totalizer at three o'clock and uh, the continuous running seconds at nine perfectly uh, align with the crown and that they are perfectly centered. Uh, there's just a very beautiful sense of, of symmetry here. I also like uh, the more uh, supple and subtle uh, outer rings uh, for 
the counters, which are a great contrast or complement against the backdrop of the white dial. And I also like uh, the more slender um, indices for the hour markers as well. It's just a very elegant, elegant piece. And we are looking at the 16520, the so-called Zenit Daytona here in stainless steel and presented with a white dial. This particular piece apparently comes from quite late in the series, from around 1999. And as a full set, including even hang tags and outer packaging. There's so many more beautiful Daytonas in this auction, and we will most certainly discuss them uh, over the coming days as well, uh, probably on Thursday. I might have a surprise uh, show on Friday. I might have an interesting unboxing to do. Uh, let's see if I can swing it. Um, has nothing to do with the Daytona, by the way, not to mislead you. Uh, but uh, I'm very excited about some of the Daytonas on this auction that we have not yet covered. But I wanted to start with something simple and beautiful or almost end uh, on this particular note with lot 138, which is a Rolex Daytona reference 16520, the so-called Zenith Daytona with the white dial uh, the piece has an estimated value between 20,000 to 40,000 euro in the neighboring lots in the lot right before we have a beautiful example of 16758. So the root beer in full gold, basically, with a tropical nipple dial uh, that seems like it's, uh, it has this like current coursing through it. Thank you, Memovox. I really appreciate you. Memovox is also a member of the channel. 50 Danish crowns. Uh, Mitchell, out of the left field, any thoughts on the Cartier tank solar beats? Um, I like a lot of variations of the tank, uh, not necessarily the tank Louis, uh, which is probably the most uh, generic kind. And that's how the tank solar beat is styled as well. I do think it's a decent value proposition already at retail. I'm sure you can get it for even cheaper in this, on the secondary market. Um, honestly, I've never been enticed by it myself, but I can certainly see the appeal of, of the solar beat movement. You know, just a grab and go watch that's, uh, you know, that's ready, that doesn't need any uh, tiresome 
or involved setting um, that you can wear and and rush out of the house especially if you if you want a dress watch but you don't necessarily wear dress watches on a daily basis it can be a decent option um, for me half the fun of the watch is is setting it is interacting with it uh, so i for me that that's a joy and i never i never looked at it as an inconvenience so uh most uh quartz powered or or solar powered watches don't attract me for that reason um and i do like a lot of different variations of the tank but tank louis is probably my my least favorite of of all but that's just me otherwise i think this is this is great and uh probably even better on the secondary market and they do have the different sizes, if I'm not mistaken, no? Yeah, it's not immediately accessible, but it's there. Uh, coming back to the root beer, I think, you know, I said before that, um, on the modern versions of the GMT Master, to me, the Jubilee bracelet is very nice, but makes the watch look very flashy, very much a jewelry piece, um, quite different in nature. Uh, from the Oyster bracelet, especially if you are used to looking at these watches uh, from a utilitarian perspective, that being said, uh, when it comes to vintage, I like them both. I like them both on, on Oyster and on the Jubilee. Nevertheless, I still prefer most GMT Masters, vintage and neo-vintage, on Oyster as well. But the root beer, whether we are talking about the two-tone version uh, or the full gold version like this, I think it just looks better. On the jubilee bracelet there's just something about it i think since everything is is a little more unexpected a little more unusual about the gmt master it just flows a little better with uh, the jubilee style bracelet which is otherwise perhaps a secondary choice uh, when it comes to this particular genre when it comes to this uh, specific model I like that molten lava look uh, under the indices of the nipple dial as well. It somehow seems fitting. And you guys know, you know, when it comes to the so-called tropical dials, the line between uh, damaged and attractive is quite blurry. And really, it is in the eye. That distinction is in the eye of the beholder. So you... Uh, make up your own mind, but I really, really like this uh, 16 758 in yellow gold uh, with the bronze 24 hour bezel on the matching Jubilee bracelets. This particular piece has a pre auction estimate set within the range between 15,000 to 30,000 in US dollars. Wow. Look at that. We have to look at some of the pocket watches from from this auction as well. At 128, we have another classic, the Audemars Piguet Royal Oak in the original reference, 5402ST.
as Jarajanta designed it, as AP introduced it in 1973, this piece is a C series, so maybe not as desirable as an A or B series Royal Oak, but it does belong to that um, 6,000 sum first reference point in the Jarajanta design of the integrated bracelet stainless steel watch. And the dial has this pleasant, uh, somewhat brownish, brassy, tropicalized color uh, with the preferred layout that places the initial logo at six o'clock. A very attractive aesthetic. The case and the bracelet certainly has seen some polish, but the piece is still very much there. And as you guys know, for the most part, these pieces, uh, when you send it to um, service in Eau de Marpigue, are very nicely and lightly polished, and, and they really look good as new. So um, I don't mind, quite honestly, I don't mind a Royal Oak that has seen some wear and tear, and that, that's not all... Um, shiny uh, as if it were the first day that it left fact factory but the option is is always uh, there the next time you send it back to service this particular example of the c series ap royal oak jumbo reference 5402 in stainless steel has a pre-auction estimate between 30,000 to 60,000 US dollars, and it does come with uh, the original certificate of the watch. Uh, bought from Salt Lake City, Utah, from Tanner Jewelry. That was lot 128. All right, the very last watch. Perhaps please hit the like button if you haven't already. I think I will do the golden ellipse, ellipse d'or. Uh, this is lot 124 for the Patek Philippe uh, golden ellipse. Uh, the piece happens to be an 18 karat yellow gold here and has that stunning uh, blue sunburst blue dial as well. Uh, which is a gold dial, but the name of the model uh, or ellipse door or the golden part anyways actually comes uh, from the design, uh, which abides by that traditional uh, golden ratio that uh, has been uh, enshrined since uh, at least the ancient uh, Greeks established by the mathematicians and used in uh, art and architecture. Patek introduced uh, this particular reference, 3848, in the late 70s, I believe in 1977. Uh, you're always welcome, Mitchell. I just saw your message. I, I find this a very elegant watch. I've always been a big fan of ellipse, especially in in white gold, but in yellow gold too. Uh, 
I think it goes beautifully with this blue dial. Very thin, very sleek, sits close to the wrist. Um, it's, it's a relatively small watch in its vintage cast that you see here. The current reference 5738, I think, is quite large, I think, for, for that design. Even feels overpowering on the wrist, at least to me. Uh, 5738 is 34.5 by 39.5. Whereas the 3848 that we are looking at right now is 27 by 32. So it's much more discreet. And again, once again, ultra thin uh, with thanks to that hand wound caliber and the lack of an exhibition case back as well, because the idea with the ellipse is to keep it as uh, low profile as possible without interfering with that ideal sense of proportion that the design represents. This particular example um, is a naked watch, uh, starts with no reserve, no box, papers, or anything else, uh, and the pre-auction estimate sets the value somewhere between 4,000 to 8,000 for lot 124, which is a Patek Philippe uh, Ellipse d'Or in yellow gold with that blued sunburst gold dial reference 3848J. Okay, um, we're all set for tonight. Uh, again, please accept my apologies. I started late. Uh, but I also have a very long day in front of me tomorrow. You guys know that I don't uh, do a late night show on Wednesdays, but I'll be back on Thursday. Um, and I might actually have an additional show at noon on Friday as well. Uh, we'll see about that. I don't make any promises, uh, but I really look forward to seeing you uh, on. Thursday night. Um, until then, uh, please feel free to uh, hit the like button, watch the other videos as well, uh, browse a little bit. If you're just chancing upon the channel, please feel free to subscribe. I have watch content on a daily basis, not only in the form of live streams, but more. So browse, enjoy the videos, hit the like button, leave some comments. I engage with every single one of them. I respond to most of them. Um, and trust me, those comments really help me, uh, of course, respond to your questions and requests. But also, I believe they boost the videos in the algorithm as well. So when the live stream ends, if you can leave a short comment, uh, whether it's positive or nasty and vicious, as Archie used to say, um, I, I would appreciate it in either case. Um, again, if you could share the link, if you could send the videos out to fellow enthusiasts and uh, friends and collectors, uh, you will help me expand this community. And that's really important for me in reaching my next goal uh, on YouTube and Instagram after knocking down 2K on both and more than 4,000 uh, followers combined between Instagram and YouTube. I really want to reach 5,000 uh, on YouTube uh, alone. That would, uh, I think, uh, set me on path for great success. As you guys know, Everything you give to the channel comes back to you in terms of quality and quantity of content, uh, which will grow day by day uh, and quite substantively and noticeably, I hope, after uh, May. So uh, I really look forward to that since 
I will be with you full time then. Um, before then, I will see you on Thursday. And uh, we'll talk about the super ellipse, uh, hopefully then as well, memo box. Uh, please accept my apologies, um, but I do have a very long day tomorrow and I, I need to go to sleep. Uh, I'll see you in the next one. Until then, stay safe, stay healthy, wear and enjoy your watches. Thank you, guys. <laughs>